this is nice. I'm so excited. A, to see you. B, to be in your little podcast hut. It's a bit hot in here today. I'm really sorry about that. That's just me. It is. It's just your beauty and gloriousness emanating um it's so lovely to do this today obviously we've been friends for quite a while now and we usually enjoy this sort of discussion with a margarita in hand yeah. whilst having our little dinner dates that oh, we have no, the best but dinner dates. so lovely but I thought it'd be really nice today for us to look back at some of the episodes of how to fail and happy place that we feel respectively have impacted us the most and just sort of discuss it and have a big old chin wag I can't Wait, and thank you so much for suggesting this because it was actually podcasts that brought us together. It is. It, we, this is the friendship that podcasts forged. <laughs> and so it's, it's like a really beautiful circular thing. So I'm just so delighted to be here. That's because the podcast world is the friendliest. So true. It just is. It's this gorgeous ecosystem where everyone supports each other. And yeah. this is not just sort of making it sound all fanciful and Disney-like. It is a really beautiful, supportive place. And um, that's why lots of us get on and, and do this sort of thing. It's gorgeous. I know. It really struck me coming from conventional media. How, it's, <laughs> how supportive. Which, and, let's face it, is bloody toxic a lot of the time. And actually full of people who don't want you to, to succeed. Yes. Whereas podcasting is so much more democratic and equitable. And you're right. Like, I've met so many amazing people, either because I've been on their podcast or they've come totally. on mine. And they become genuine friends. And we're all really supportive of each other so it's just lovely to raise a, a rising tide raises all boats oh isn't that beautiful <laughs> two old boats sat chatting about life <laughs> let's crack on so I have chosen to kick off with Emily Ratajkowski who came on Happy Place a little while ago I found this conversation fascinating because I'm deeply intrigued about I guess what it is to be a woman in the modern world and we are often presented with these thoughts that women can have it all and do it all. Yeah. And we're confused whether that's a feminist thing to say or an anti-feminist thing to say. Yeah. I, I'm, I never like to put labels on things too much, but I think it's a really good discussion point. So in this, we chat a bit about if it's possible to be an overtly sexy woman and be taken seriously. You are objectified. You, you know, do you're sexualized at maybe very young, even if you're a woman who's, you know, done a bunch of amazing journalistic work, like there is kind of this push to be also hot. Um, and then on the other end, celebrated in that way. And then on the other side of it, there's this sort of shaming that comes with it of like, well, now nobody's gonna take you seriously because, you know, you're a slut, quote unquote, or um, even from feminists, I think that there's this feeling of like, well, now you've, you've played into the male gaze, so therefore you're not progressive, you're not helping women. Um, and, you know, that's really what the book is kind of dealing with, because that's been my experience even before I was a model or in the public spotlight, just, you know, as a 13 year old getting dressed and kind of like having a new body and having a woman's body for the first time and um, feeling the attention from men when I dressed a certain way, um, also like feeling afraid because of the attention, also feeling validated because of the attention, then, um, you know, having a uh, teacher snap my bra strap and feeling like I was typecast in a certain way because of, you know, the, the way I was presenting myself. So it's complicated. And I think it's something um, we just get it from all sides, really. Yeah. And, you know, is there a conclusion? Because I think that's the question that I kept asking myself mm. when I was reading your book is, but wait, can a woman, and I and I want the answer to be yes as a mm -hmm. feminist, but can, can a woman show her sexiness? Can she express her sexual desires, dress in an overtly sexy way and be listened to and be taken mm. seriously and be respected? I, I don't know if that is true in the day day and age that we're in today yeah I, I don't think it is I think it's really complicated um I think there are examples of women who've managed it Jane Fonda is somebody who's done done both there are examples for sure um I even <clears throat> think like Megan the Stallion is somebody who you know people respect but she also I mean music is kind of its own category interestingly but um, there, there are examples. Uh, I would even say Cardi B is a great example. I mean, she, against all odds, she's had to fight and work for it. And she deals with race, which is a whole other factor of people not taking you seriously. Um, but, uh, I think the issue is that, you know, what a lot of feminists would say is like, if you, you know, doing something to 
feel good if it's playing into the male gaze then it's ultimately actually hurtful and harmful to women my issue is like god doesn't kind of everything we do like in some ways play into that um like even just putting on mascara in the morning and um making sure that like our our skin looks a certain way and um one of the episodes i'm doing soon is called um uh, the question I'm asking is, can you be a feminist and get plastic surgery? Because I'm just interested in the kind of lines that women draw around what they feel is feminist and is okay. And how, you know, just what kind of shirt you wear on a given day to work and, um, or just not even to work just out on the streets in public. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's something I'm really fascinated by. And I would say that I don't have an answer. Basically, we can't win. We can't. <laughs> But one of the things I'm most impressed about is how you pronounced her surname. You nailed that. I practiced it in the mirror a lot. It I'm wasn't even a gonna, stumble. <laughs> not going to lie. It's a great surname. It is. It is. I found it so interesting, this episode, mm. because as I was walking down the street listening to it, and I remember this, I felt that I knew how I thought about these issues. And then I would question what I thought I knew. Mm. Because we all live in such an imperfect world that has been built around patriarchal foundations. And so we can't ever remove ourselves from that context in a way. But my position is being a feminist is about believing in equal rights for women and men. So if you believe that and you live your life according to that premise, you are a feminist and it sort of doesn't matter what else you do on top of that as long as that's a fundamental belief that you pursue. I agree. But you really have to look at your own um, opinions and really excavate them. And yeah. this episode made me do that massively. And I think even since that episode, I've found situations really interesting. The other day, I was in a discussion online about um, body image for women specifically, because that's the only perception I have and the life experience. And I had given the example of another male host presenter and talked about the fact that they wouldn't have such a spotlight on their body or what they're wearing or what their body looked like, etc. And somebody had commented on that post saying, yeah, but I don't see him posting pictures of himself in the mirror with an outfit on. I don't think they were meaning to sound particularly yeah. punchy. But my thought process, having spoken to Emily, was... So, OK, so we have to play to male standards or norms to be taken seriously. Yeah. And also it depends which men we're looking at, because there are men who do that. There are men who are creatively fueled and Tom Daly has a passion for knitting and has fantastic outfits that he posts. So I think it's more about how we express our creativity. Yeah. And I know that's partly how you express yours. Massively, you, yeah. The way that you dress, the way that you present yourself, the phenomenal way you do your makeup, which we were chatting <laughs> about before, that's all driven by your interest in yeah. art and connection through art. Yeah. And so I totally get it. And I think it's more interesting that that's the response of someone looking at you doing that, that that response is conditioned by the society that they've grown up in. Yeah. And it would be really great not only to question the context that we're in when we make decisions, but also the context that we're in when we have responses to other women. Totally. But I think going back to your first reaction to that clip, it's just do what makes you feel good. Yeah. And we've just got to stop judging other people. And therefore, we'll end up judging ourselves less. That's the beauty of that one. Yes. You stop judging other people and then you have much more self-compassion and you're less judgmental towards your own actions, which is... Always a plus. Preach. So, which episode <laughs> would you like to dig into from How to Fail? I have chosen one of my favourite episodes of all time, which genuinely changed my life. And it is with Mo Gaudat, who came on How to Fail way back in 2019 in season four. The type of thought that makes us unhappy is incessant thinking. Incessant thinking is basically your brain sounding the siren. Something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. That incessant thinking doesn't lead to anything, doesn't change anything in the real world. It happens in the midline areas of your brain. There are two other types of thoughts that are useful. One of them is insightful thinking, and the other is experiential thinking. Insightful thinking is when you solve a problem. Experiential thinking is when you observe the world as it is. Okay, Those happen mostly on the right-hand side of the brain, some in the prefrontal cortex, some in the insula, and so on. Those kinds of thoughts are the thoughts you should allow your brain to give you. 
And by the way, that's the attitude we use at work. If someone walks into my office and complains, I don't let them complain incessantly. Midway, I say, is there any information we're missing about this? Should we look at this differently? This is insightful thinking, okay? And experiential thinking. This is basically looking at the world as it is. Then I ask, what can we do about it? And that's exactly what I do with my brain. Ali, my son, leaves our world, okay? People think that I'm not given a choice. I am given two choices. One of them is to cry for the rest of my life. And then 27 years later, when I'm on my deathbed, Ali will still not be there. Is that a wise choice? The other is to do something about it. That doesn't bring him back. Nothing's going to bring him back. It's the truth. He left, right? But what I can do is I at least can make my life a little better and his life and the life of a billion people a little better than than the day he left. Isn't that a better way of doing it? Now, of course, I feel pain. I miss him tremendously. But pain doesn't dictate how my brain tortures me. Pain is different than suffering. Pain is I remember him, I feel that I miss him. Suffering is my brain telling me you should have driven him to another hospital. And my brain did, by the way. Okay? I allow my brain only two types of thought. One is useful thinking and the other is joyful thinking. Anything else, I say, Becky, stop, behave. Useful thinking. If my brain tells me you should have driven him to another hospital, I basically say to my brain, I cannot do this right now. Do you have something you want to tell me that I can do? I wish I could, but I cannot. Give me a useful thought. So my brain says, why don't we write the happiness model we learned with him, share it with 10 million people was the original target, hmm? and make 10 million people remember him and love him and send him a happy wish. That would be a good way to honor him. Great. That's a great idea, brain. Thank you. That's how we should think, right? Or a joyful thought. Until today, I promise you, three to four times a week, I wake up in the morning or I go to bed at night and the only thought that comes to my head is Ali died. He's part of my heart. It's just, I feel that part of me is missing, right? I answer in a very simple way and I say, yes, brain, but Ali also lived. Do you understand that? Ali died is a horribly painful thought. Ali lived is the same thought, but it's a beautiful thought. It's 21 years of joy, of wisdom, of learning, of insightful discoveries, of memories of him taking care of Aya, taking care of me, taking care of his mother that I wouldn't replace for anything. Honestly, even if you tell me, we'll take away your pain for losing your son, I wouldn't say, no, 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 hold on. I want him. I want the 21 years. Don't lie to me, brain. Don't lie to me. But think about those. Because when I say Ali lived, I start to get memories that are all happy, all joyful, all things that we did together. That's me being the boss. That's me telling my brain to take charge so that if there is something we can do, we do it. If there isn't, then don't torture me because there is no point to torture me if there is nothing I can do about it. I chose that clip because it changed the way that I think about thinking. And you can hear there how well Mo explains quite profound concepts. And to give it a bit of context, he's talking there about his late son, Ali, who died age 21 during a routine operation. And the Becky that he mentions briefly is his Becky brain. So Mo calls the incessant anxious brain that is constantly pointing out the things that might go wrong. He calls that brain Becky after a girl at his school who did the same thing. (laughs) So great. (laughs) With apologies for any Beckys listening. But there's something about that technique which sounds so simple, but it's genuinely life changing because it separates you from that part of your brain you feel then that you can have a conversation with your anxious thoughts rather than being wholly defined by them and swallowed up by them. And it's a technique that I use and that I find immensely helpful. And I'm just so grateful to Mo for sharing that. Yeah, I think it that episode will have helped so many people because we all get stuck in that negative loop where an issue from the past or something you're worrying about in the future is obsessional and you just get stuck in it. So I think being able to see the difference between sort of rational thought on what you know to be true versus that worry. And I really found it interesting hearing him talk about the difference between pain and suffering. Yes. That is a game changer. I never really thought of it like that before, that 
the um, goal isn't to sort of rid yourself of pain in life because it's a given that we're all going to experience pain. But suffering, that's perhaps optional in terms of the varying degrees of suffering you're willing to put yourself through. Exactly. I think it's having the awareness of that, isn't it? Yeah, and it sounds very difficult and it is very difficult yeah, to make that choice. But the one way of putting it is... You experience pain when you drink a cup of tea that's too hot. You burn your tongue. That's the pain. The suffering is then for weeks and months afterwards to go, what a stupid person I am to have made my tea so hot yeah. that I burnt my tongue. And you're piling self-loathing on top of everything else. And it's absolutely very hard to do in a, in a much deeper context. If you've suffered great loss or you're going through a really difficult time or you've just been diagnosed with a terrible illness, it's an incredibly difficult, challenging thing to do. And it is one of those things that needs to become a daily practice, I believe, because it won't be easy to begin with. But if you keep in dialogue with your Becky brain or with your Jennifer brain or with your think of another Kevin brain, then I, my experience is that that has really helped me. If I've just kept at it, it has actually helped. You can build up resilience like a muscle. That's so brilliant. I've picked this next episode because it's a conversation that you and I have yeah. had in real life quite often because we are both part of a blended family. I sometimes feel weird saying that word blended, but I think it's probably the truest uh, sort of description you can give a family where you've merged pre-existing families, kids, whatever. Um, and obviously Rio and Kate Ferdinand have made a beautiful documentary about this. They've been very generous in sharing their experiences of it and continue to do so. Um, and I learned a lot and implemented some of my learnings into how I go about running a home that's blended and um, dealing with the challenges that you face having a blended family. And then all of a sudden I found myself here with three stepchildren. I think, wow, that's, that's a big turnaround. I didn't really, like you, naively think too much about it. Mm. I just thought, I'm nice, it's going to be okay, I'll manage it and I'll get through everything. I didn't really think of the dynamics that go with with it, even moving in this house showering and the kids knocking the door and you've got no clothes on like just mad stuff that I didn't even think about I think it's only when I moved in and I thought wow this is hard there's a lot to, there's a lot to think about mm. different areas that people don't even see um it was tough wasn't it I think discipline's a huge one because yeah in each household discipline's different different and we used to have loads <laughs> of conversations about how how far can I go how how loud can I should I shout or how firm should I be? Like there's so many, and there ain't really a dial on the wall that you just say that's go at number six and that'll be fine. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's so much trial and error that, and you're you're scared of getting stuff wrong. You never want to get it wrong because you're a perfectionist in that sense. Yeah, and I also think it's more you as a family had your own way of doing things, and I grew up with this way that I thought I would be a parent and that I would do. And one of the main ones is Rio allowed the children to play football in the house. And from when I was in, yes, <laughs> from in when this I, beautiful, <laughs> gorgeous house with gorgeous stuff everywhere. Exactly my point. Um, but when I was a kid, I was never allowed to play the ball in the house, and that is something that just I said, Ria, I can't cope with this. And he said, But this is what we do, and there sort of had to be a, a thing that now's the new thing that we do. But that was hard. It was hard, wasn't it? Football played in the house for about a year, and then one day I said, Guys, I can't cope with this anymore. You've got three stepchildren. How have you approached discipline? I struggle with this one hugely. It's so difficult and that's why I'm so thrilled that you picked this clip because it's very rare that you get step parents who feel able to talk openly and publicly. And that's partly because we're all so aware that we have lots of other people's lives taken into consideration when we open up this conversation. Discipline is one of the hardest things. I... I'm really quite lucky now in that my stepchildren are that bit older, so they're all teenagers. I was married before and I was also a stepmother then and the children were much younger and it was a dysfunctional relationship for me in many ways. And my experience of that relationship was that I was not allowed to have my own opinion about what went on in our house and that was really really difficult for me and I think that it really depends for step parents on how well navigated or not well navigated the divorce has been 
Because if it hasn't been that well navigated, often the knock-on effect is that one parent feels really guilty and therefore that parent doesn't want to discipline their kids when they come and stay. Yeah. And that's a very tricky thing for a new partner to know how to deal with. And also because at the time that that happens, the new partner is probably resented understandably by the children in question. My situation now is so much better because my husband and his ex have done an incredible job of co-parenting and navigating the end of their marriage. And their children are great. And actually, they don't need me that much. And in a way, that's that's very liberating. So I never once would make the mistake of thinking that I'm in any way their parent. I'm absolutely not. I hope I'm someone who they can turn to and who offers a different perspective on life. Um, and the thing that I've noticed has really helped with like this time round is that my husband and I, like Kate and Rio, I feel real, really able to talk to my husband about things and we have great chats about it and he respects my opinion. That's key. It's key. It's key. And also because I'm a woman without children of her own, very often I feel that my opinion can be very easily dismissed by other parents. My husband never does that and I've never felt like that in that family unit. So I think what Kate and Rio went on to say that, that they have a daily debrief, don't they, before they go to bed. Yeah. And I loved that idea. And for Kate, it's so much more challenging or differently challenging in many ways because very sadly, Rio's first wife died. Yeah. And so to to be stepping into that huge. Is, is huge and a whole different dynamic. How are you finding it, Fern? I have found, it's, do you know what? It's really varied over the years because when I met my husband, Arthur and Lola, my stepkids, were five and nine. So they were quite tiny and it was a real novelty. And I just thought, this is fun. We get to like go to the cinema and, you know, go to adventure playgrounds. I'd never done that as an adult. <laughs> yeah. So I just thought it was all fun. And I think over the years, I realised the seriousness of it in terms of the impact that I would have on them growing up and navigating the world. And I feel very similarly to you. I'm not trying to be another parent. I sort of have found the language maybe like guide useful. I want to be a That's guide a great, in their life. great term. Yeah, I want to, like you, I want to be someone that they turn to if they feel they need help or advice. And um, luckily that has happened. And it's been like the most special moments where I feel like so included in their life and big moments, which is... You know, I cherish our relationship so much. You know, for, for as a step-parent, it's one of the most glorious things that it's taken a lot of hard work. It's taken a lot of discussions with me and Jesse, who was that dad at the start, who felt guilty and all of those things and, you know, wanted the kids just to be happy all the time. But we've navigated it together and all of us have changed how we parent and deal with the ever-changing family dynamics. And... My stepkids are now 21 and nearly 18. And we're probably in a place where we sort of have, you know, decent conversations, have fun. Um, it's less about sort of discipline and homework and bedtime and all the stuff that we've had to sort of trudge through previously. So I think for anyone going through that transition now, in a cliche way, it does get easier. It does I was get about better. To say exactly the same thing because. Uh, my stepchildren are 19, 16 and 13 and it's really lovely with the 19-year-old having an independent relationship yes. with him and I just wanted to say exactly the same thing, that it's such a difficult thing sometimes to go through when they're younger. Yeah. But as they get older, even though you might never feel appreciated, I promise you that as they get older, you end up understanding that you are. You are and they understand the relationship with more clarity I think. Like my stepson who's at university will like call me out of the blue and I could like weep when I see his name on the phone like he's called me oh my god that would never have happened five years ago. I think it does take you know a sort of level of maturity and them sort of understanding it which just happens to all kids that they have probably a different perspective of parents step parents as they get older but anyone going through it Please listen to that chat because I think it was just very helpful for me and I've taken a lot of learnings from it. Um, so who are you going to chat about next? 
I am going to chat about the wonderful Alexandra Burke, the singer Alexandra Burke, who came on <clears throat> season 10 of How to Fail. And the reason I've picked this clip is because you and I both remember the 90s and the early 2000s and the way that women and particularly women of colour and particularly women of colour in the music industry were treated is something that looking back on, I am astonished that we let society get away with. And Alexandra came on and just spoke so openly and vulnerably about that that I wanted to share it. I was sat down and told, you're never going to be good enough because of your colour. You're never going to sell a certain amount of records because, you know, you may not appeal to a certain audience. And I was told to bleach my skin and you're never going to perform on the Brits because they wouldn't have a black artist perform on the Brits. The most you're going to do is just one X factor and that's the biggest it will get for you. And all of that is bullshit, excuse my French. It's just mm. ridiculous because I was never brave enough to say that 10 years ago when I was told that. I sat there and thought, well, if that's the case, I'm just going to work really hard so that I can achieve everything you've told me that I can't. And, you know, granted, yes, I haven't performed on the Brits before, but I've been nominated. And that in itself is a huge honour. And all the little things about not selling music, well, that's rubbish too, because I have sold. So all the little things that I was told that you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, no, I have proved you wrong in some kind of way because I've worked really hard to try my best to achieve things that I'm proud of. But if it wasn't for my family, if it wasn't for my mum in particular, for my amazing, beautiful friends and the team I currently have around me, I don't know where I'd be mentally, mm. if I'm honest with you. I don't know where I'd be because keeping that strong face and keeping that strong spirit up, don't get me wrong, I'm a very positive person, but it's very difficult to keep it up when you are feeling at your lowest. And, but also, you know, and being made to feel literally like you can't be yourself. Yes. You're too much of something in this right. way or that way. I find it so depressing and flabbergasting that this was only 10 years ago that yeah. people were talking to you in these terms. And I mm -hmm. feel angry on your behalf and you sound really mature and measured about it. But do you think, Thank were you, you, I'm guessing you weren't allowed to be angry. No. But where did, also, did you feel anger and where did it go? I think for me, so it takes a lot to really pee me off. <laughs> Bless her. It's mad. It is so mad. And I, it really opened my eyes to what she went through. She came onto How to Fail so ready and willing to be unbelievably vulnerable. She also talked about the death of her mother and how that impacted her and how she kept on working right up to the last minute because it was sort of her way of coping and how she was portrayed in the press and the tabloid press in a certain way as being a massive diva on X Factor and placing lots of demands. And I was speaking to this woman who was just so wonderful. You can hear it there. Oh, I, she's I feel, an angel. She really is. There's a real honesty to her and such a level of openness that actually in the middle of that interview, I was like, is this ethical for me to be doing this interview? Because she was so raw. And then it was such a beautiful experience putting that episode out there to see the response that it had and how loved I think she felt as a result of it. And we've become friends subsequently. We were talking about earlier about making podcast friends. Yeah. And I just really respect her for having kept her head high through all of that. And I wanted to talk to you about it because of the way you were portrayed or you felt you had to handle the tabloid press at a certain time in your life when you were also searching for your identity and yeah. how difficult that was and how I hope it's changing um I think it is but I think the press are always going to be just without a moral compass and you know uh tarnish people with certain brushes very flippantly and it is part and parcel very sadly of being in the public eye and we've seen the extreme detriments that that leads to you know people taking their own lives and and then it still doesn't change so uh, for someone like Alexandra to have been through that, the, the, the extremities of, of the discrimination and the language used against her, um, it's just, ugh, I mean, thank God that she's just still using that incredible voice that she's got to Amazing entertain voice. people, yeah. to soothe people. <laughs> I once went on a... This is quite random. I trekked to Machu Picchu with Alexandra. That is so random. Was it's it for charity? so random, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Myself and Denise Van Outen organised a trek for uh, several breast cancer charities. And Alexandra willingly said yes. And we had this incredible experience where we trekked for about a week together. 
And she would occasionally just sort of burst into song and you'd be like walking past a couple of llamas <laughs> on a field in Peru. And then all of a sudden this voice. I mean, she's just pure <coughs> raw talent. And it's like, how can you... We're wearing sort of dirty trekking clothes and peeing behind rocks. There she is with this angelic voice just sort of soothing us all. It was... She's a remarkable person. I think, yes, sadly, probably the music industry is still more toxic than others in terms of the expectations upon female artists. But I'm glad when anyone speaks up like Alexandra, they're helping to break down those barriers. And as painful as it is to talk about for for Alex, brilliant that she's, you know, courageous enough to do so. Couldn't agree more. And if you haven't seen her X Factor final performance oh, with Beyonce, Beyonce, do you remember Beyonce yes, came I on do. British X Factor? <laughs> you so have to amazing. go and YouTube it right now. That one and the other one that I was obsessed with was when she did the Christina Aguilera song and she was dressed up in, what was that song called? Anyway, she was dressed up in this kind of uh, navy type uniform and she did this incredibly hectic, a sort of foot perfect dance routine and her singing was completely on point as well. Yeah. Like, she actually danced and sang at the same time. She's remarkable. <laughs> we love you, Alex. You're the best. Um, so, next up, I have chosen to go with the episode where Roman Kemp came on Happy Place. This one impacted me greatly because, obviously, they're all subject matters, you know, that he was discussing that I'm deeply interested in, whether it's depression, suicide... Um, just general mental health, his own. And obviously he lost one of his dear friends and radio producer who took his own life. And Roman has um, really faced that pain fully by talking about that period of his life. And he goes around schools relentlessly talking to kids. And that's the bit that really impacted me, how we talk to kids about mental health. Because I've been very cagey to talk to my own kids about depression, anxiety, we, I've been fearful to do so. Mm. I'm not even sure why. I just thought, oh, I can't use those words in front of them. And he directly said the absolute opposite, which I found fascinating. We're sitting here now and, and less than 50% of schools in the UK have some form of outlet in terms of a therapist or a counsellor. That means it's over 50% that don't. And it's like, uh, one thing that is is so prevalent and and is so tough is that I hear a lot of people, parents, that I've certainly spoken to, that have had kids that have taken their own life. And when I say kids, I mean like nine years old, ten years old, happy kids, had children. Do you know what I mean? You know, and they've then gone and lied to their friends about how they've died, and. That's because of this weird shame thing. Again, yeah. you know, this un unacceptance of, of what's happened. And then you have to think about all the friends in that school year. You have to think about, you know, okay, how is that going to affect them moving forward? You know, how is that trauma going to affect them? You know, I'm a nearly 30-year-old man and mine has messed me up big time, you know, so I can only imagine how it would affect kids. So I think that when people start realising the reality of this isn't just men now you know i think i think it's under the, you know when you said that stat about under the age of 40 it's, it's men and boys yeah you know the problem with suicide is is children like it's that's that's where it needs to be stopped you know if you can get into people about you know, before that age of 16 where they've made that conscious decision to open up as much as they possibly can you know five years old you know i, I went to a school in birmingham and they're a school that, that practice, um, you know, mental health at quite a high level with their pupils, almost like a test wow. run thing. And I had a five-year-old talk to me about what depression is. And it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Wow. Because I know for a fact that that five-year-old you don't sit there and tell them this, but I know for a fact that that five-year-old at some point in their life will experience some form of depression. Mm -hmm. And they will go back to those things that they learned at school and go, this is normal to have. This is okay. I can do this. Yeah, that really um, just changed my mind on so much. And interestingly, I've... I probably still have a level of fear when talking to my kids about any mental health issue. I need to get over that because that's quite literally all I talk about in my in sort of work capacity. But it still feels treacherous for some reason. And I need to hmm. work that out. And um, 
I've talked to Rex a little bit about anxiety and he was he already knew the word. They, they talk about that sort of thing at school, not even a teacher led sort of situation, but amongst friends. I think they're much more savvy than we were as kids because the language is more ubiquitous and and used. So we've I've tentatively started walking towards that because I really you know, if this is sort of like what I'm dedicating my life to, this kind of conversation, I've got to implement it in my own home. And I think it always feels much more intimate and terrifying at times, I think, to have those sorts of chats. But I think, I don't think we should be shying away from it, whether it's with friends, even our parents. I think that's a whole other thing, sort of talking to people where there are barriers up when it comes to mental health. We've got to just knock all of those barriers down. And it is really scary. I think the closest example I can come to in my own life is fertility and the realisation I had when I started talking openly about the fact that I'd had miscarriages and unsuccessful fertility treatment, I was really scared because there is still so much misplaced stigma and shame around that, particularly for women, because you feel wrongly that you might have failed your biological role as a woman. And I'm saying that's the wrong thing to feel And it's understandable that you do. And I definitely internalise that. But as soon as I started, actually, I started writing about it openly before I started speaking about it openly. I was so heartened by the knock on effect because it turned out that lots of other people had experienced something similar and felt able to connect with me over that. And now I feel really passionate about it. That's different from talking to younger children about things that you don't you don't want to freak them out. And I suppose it's also different when you're you're suffering something yourself, when you're living with all of these issues. Because as a parent, I imagine you want to be the strong one, the one who has it sorted, the one who protects your beloved kids. And that must be a very difficult line to tread. So yes, yeah. you, Fern, can talk about mental health as it pertains to the wider world, but how much do you tell your child about your own mental health journey? Yeah, and also I've still got stigma around it because clearly that fear is is driven by yeah. the stigma. Even I place upon my own situations that I've been through or isho- issues that I still have, you know, sort of panic attacks or insomnia that can lead to panic. I still feel like that there's a sense of failure there, definitely. So I think that stops me from having decent chats with my kids about it because if I was truly at peace with it which I think is very big ask with any of these issues whether it's fertility mental health I think it's a big ask to have full acceptance of where you're at I think Mm. it's a life's work if you know if I did have that full acceptance maybe I could walk into that conversation more courageously because there'd be nothing to lose there's nothing to worry about if you experience this to my kids whatever but I think it's You know, these are tricky conversations, hence why we both like having them. If this was easy, we wouldn't be doing it. Do you know what I mean? We we have chosen to dive into subjects that feel painful sometimes, gritty, extremely personal, but ultimately are so connective. And that's what I got from talking to Roman was that you have to bypass that fear to get to that ultimate connection of having a chat with whether it's your own kid or kids in schools or other members of your family or friends. You know, the other part of that conversation was checking in with friends to the level where you don't give up. If you feel something's a little bit off, that you bypass again that fear to connect with them truly to work out if they're OK or not. I have to say, just speaking personally, that you're an amazing friend in the way that you do that. And you've done that for me at some really low points, including sending me this jumper that I'm currently (laughs) wearing. And I so appreciate it because the way you check in is incredibly generous and thoughtful and it doesn't come with any expectation of a reply. And sometimes you need to hear from your friend and you need to just reassure yourself that they're okay. But you will just do something really lovely and send a text saying I love you mate and it means so much because in that moment I feel less isolated less confused less sad less alone and so I just want to pay tribute to you on a personal level for being one of those people Uh, well that honestly makes me want to cry (laughs) um it means a lot because I know the power and the impact that has when people do that for you when you're very low and I also know how awful it is when nobody texts you in those moments which Mm. I've also experienced in times where people don't know what to say to you and that fear of getting it wrong puts them off saying anything that is a lonely place to be so I would say 
even if you use clumsy language or you get it wrong, you say the wrong thing, reach out. Even if it is just to tell someone you love them, it makes the world of difference. Definitely. Just say I'm thinking of you. Yeah. Or, in my case, leave a 10-minute rambling voice note. <laughs> Or send a jumper, another option. <laughs> oh, this jumper's my favourite. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got a, a last clip from you. And yes. uh, you know that I'm the biggest <laughs> fangirl of this person. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here now and swoon as I listen to you chat. I picked this one because I wanted to have something lighthearted because we do have such deep and meaningful conversations all the time and I love that. But I wanted an opportunity to laugh and also... Levity is so important. It is. Yes. Light and shade. Yes. Yin and yang. Um... <laughs> I also chose this because it's the first episode of How to Fail ever. What? I didn't know that. Yes. So it's season one, episode one. And I interviewed Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who is famous as Fleabag and less famously also a good friend of mine. And so she agreed to be one of my first ever guests. And I'm I'm forever grateful to her for taking that risk. <laughs> and she spoke about a time when she really embarrassed herself in front of Meryl Streep. I was really excited to meet Meryl Streep when I was doing The Iron Lady. Although Is I was... she? <laughs> I, was very, I was weird with her, though. I go weird around celebrities and always very in a very individual way for each celebrity. I should just not be around them. <laughs> what did you say to Meryl Streep that was weird? Well, Meryl Streep was doing The Iron Lady and she was in this prosthetic sort of whole body face scenario. The lights were so hot, so whenever she was on set, she didn't, she couldn't really speak in between because so much energy was taken up and just like acting through this, you know, mask and everything. So when the lights, so she would never say anything in between cuts, and we always knew it. She was always like, "I'm really sorry, but I just can't." I knew I just need to like power down, have a glass, of, like sip some water through the straw. But there was one day when uh, the lights went off, they called cut, and then she just turned around to this room of people and went, you know, in her Margaret Thatcher voice, and just went, "So you know, how's everybody's day?" And everyone just freaked out. Everyone just like froze in the room because they were like, "Oh my god!" Everyone at the same time, like we were like vultures, just like this is our moment <laughs> to have to share words with Meryl Streep. And uh, so everyone sort of was being very casual, and it was uh, the scene was like a drinks party or something, but edging towards her with this kind of wild look in their eye, and everyone was trying to have some some personal bants with uh, with Meza. So she was just opening the conversation and then it was getting like weirdly competitive and we were like crowding around her but everyone was trying to be very casual and then she started up this conversation about something. Anyway, I tried a joke and it landed <gasps> and she laughed and she was like, oh, and everyone else just looked at me with steel and an ashen face and fury and I was like, hey, I've won it. She's mine. Yes. She's mine. So she was mine. But after that, I was like, she's totally mine. She's totally mine. We're going to have a day together. We're going to like, like nod to each other respectfully in the corridors. We're going to, we may even like, you know, graduate to a drink at some point. And then um, at lunchtime, I was sitting at this table with everybody and I was eating this apple crumble and she came down the stairs. She was feeling lively this day, uh, obviously outside of the prosthetic. She came down the stairs and she was walking towards me. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Like she's going to come to the table and we're friends now because I was the one that made her laugh. And she walked up to the table and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, uh, oh, what are you eating? I have never answered that. I, just, I got so excited about the banter with Mel that I flung my apple crumble straight into my chest <laughs> my costume chest and I and I literally squawked my apple crumble <laughs> and she went oh and then she went back to her American accent which she hadn't done for the whole time and she went I wasn't going to take it from you <laughs> And I was just holding this awful, like, dripping think? pudding over my my beautiful silk shirt. That they'd made. And I'm just holding it there really tightly, not letting it go. I was just like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Everyone just looked at me like, what was that? That was the strangest response. And then she was like, oh, okay. And then she she moved off. And then I had to go and apologise for the costume thing. Oh, my so just weird stuff like that. You made her break character. You made Meryl Streep break character. <laughs> oh, I've got a little hot for her. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Honestly, the amount of times people will message me or come up to me and say, the apple crumble story, my apple crumble. (laughs) And it just, I mean, Phoebe's an amazing storyteller, as we all know. And it has me in hysterics every time I listen to it. 
But it also, <laughs> I think, you know, the reason I started How to Fail is because I wanted to make it clear that we all fail. And yes. even people that we look up to and admire who seem to have it all sorted, who are famous in their own rights, even they embarrass themselves in the most ridiculous ways. Yes, I think it's really interesting when you start to talk to famous people, people in the public eye, that you realise that many of them, definitely myself included, don't feel part of that gang. Yes, like when I so meet famous people, I see them as like uh, otherworldly, and I do uh, just like Phoebe, weird shit, say weird things, do weird things. As I was listening to that, I thought I've done so many strange things. Some I had to block out because they've been so weird. But I remember once interviewing Clint Eastwood. I interviewed Clint Eastwood. How did I know you were going to say that? We're, this is how connected we oh are. Oh my god! And I was so nervous did you about not? it. Same. Well, of course, it's Clint <laughs> fucking Eastwood. Yes, yeah. And I um. I, after the interview, sort of took his champagne out of his hand and drank it. <laughs> that is so it's chic. not okay. No, it's not. It's really common, which is what I am. It's really not okay. What? Were you interviewing him for TV or radio? Yeah, it was for or the Oscars. I was in Los Angeles. It sounds very glamorous, but again, I was in the room going, I shouldn't be here. This is completely absurd that I am in a room full of people like Clint Eastwood. So I behave strangely yeah. because I don't know how to contain that. That sort of pulsating energy of like, I need to jump out of my own skin. That's so, thank you for sharing that. That is so, it makes all the rest of us, I think, feel loads better. It's fascinating. Oh, I've done it's way weirder, but I, and drink. I honestly think I've sort of blocked them out in a PTSD sort yeah. of mind blank. I, I interviewed Clint Eastwood way back when I worked for The Observer, and it was the first major interview that they trusted me with. And it was a film junket for a film starring Angelina Jolie called The Changeling that he directed. I was given a grand total of 20 minutes, which sat, for radio and TV sounds like a lot. For print journalist is just not very much no. at all. I was so nervous and I really crafted my questions and all that. Walked in, he could not have been more charming or more charismatic. He was 78 at the time. He was so lovely to me. But I remember asking him if it was true that he was a £20 baby because that was on his Wikipedia page. <laughs> He was like, no, I was not. <laughs> that would be physically impossible. But I think I was quite big. Like, oh, that's how nice I was. You are with I it. I'm having flashbacks now we're on this subject that are making my toes curl. <laughs> I've had another one. This oh, was tell me. so bad. This is, it's not even bad, like traumatic. It's just so weird. Okay. Oh, it was so odd. So I was interviewing Kings of Leon who I love on a sort of, I'm a fan, mm. a mega fan. And I've I've loved every single album. I've sort of studied lyrics. Like I'm obsessed with them. I've seen them live countless times. And I've interviewed them a few times. Yeah. But on one occasion, it was probably one of the, the earlier interviews I'd done with them. It could have even been the first. And it was Caleb and Nathan. And we were chatting and the interview wrapped up and we ended up getting onto the subject of tattoos. I don't know how. And I, no, <laughs> don't. No, I know where it's going. It's so bad. Oh so God. I started sort of getting overexcited. And when, obviously, I'm nervous, I just talk and yeah. I don't stop. And I was sort of listing all of my tattoos. And I was like, oh, and the biggest one's on my foot. Then I reached down. I had laced up Converse on, so it's quite palaver to get them off. Yeah. I unlaced the whole shoe. They just sat there watching me <laughs> silently. Take my shoe off, take my sock off. Then sort of showing them my bare foot in an interview <laughs> setting. But it was the sort of 30 second silence that felt like an hour yeah. where I was unlacing my shoe. And they're probably thinking, why is she doing this? Is this has gone off she the rails, need, hasn't it? She, we don't need to see her foot. We, and, and we don't care. And we've probably got eight other junket interviews to do. Can you get this mad fan out like oh fan but do you know what i think it is especially in those junket settings you and i strive for connection in all aspects of our life here's my and, foot yeah Connect. and in the junket it's actually really hard because you're part of this conveyor hard. belt it is literally like that hugh grant scene in notting hill it is so you're just exactly like here that. love me love my foot <laughs> oh i'm awful but do you know I what's interesting so phoebe was my first ever guest so that was july 2018 that episode went out and, and fleabag season one had aired but she obviously then went on to become yeah. mega like a mega star so Fleabag season two came out Killing Eve came out all of the other amazing stuff that she's done and she came back on How to Fail two years after that first episode to talk about what that level of success was really like and how actually there are failures within that and it was super interesting mm. I've only ever had 
a handful of guests back on. But it was so interesting to have someone who had experienced this kind of global level of fame and success. Yeah. And to have someone so self-aware and so insightful that she could really analyse all of that and say, well, actually, I regret this and I feel I failed at that. It's so interesting because we still collectively have this uh, belief that when you reach a certain level of success or whether it is as sort of vapid as it being just fame, mm -hmm. that we're going to feel complete and everything's going to be all right. And that we put those people on a pedestal, that they're untouchable, that they could never sort of feel pain or experience anything awful. And it's all, it's total nonsense. Yeah. But it's hot. Even I fall into that trap and I interview people who are really famous all the time. And I still think they're better than me. They're yeah. more together than me. They don't, you know, show people their bare foot in interview <laughs> settings. Not that you know. <laughs> they might do. Might Shania Twain might do that all the time. Oh, just as a little warm-up intro. Oh, I can't bear it. I learned a big <laughs> lesson there. Um, this has been very insightful, I would say. I've, you know, I love listening to your podcast as a fan, so I'm constantly Ditto. learning from the work that you do. But it's so nice to really hone in on certain life lessons and things that we've respectively taken away. And I think, if anything, I feel more motivated to, to go and do that. And also, I think listening to these clips has made me really realise what a privilege it is to interview people. Mm. I never, and I know you feel the same, I never take it for granted that I get to have a deep, deep conversation with someone. We're asking people, strangers often, questions that we don't ask our own friends. Totally. So it is a, it's a total privilege. It really, really is. I want to thank you for having this idea. I've loved doing it. It was, it was so wonderful trawling through our respective back catalogues. And actually, we didn't discuss which clips we were going to no. choose, but it flowed together so beautifully. And I think that we've covered so much ground. And I just want to thank you also for opening up these kind of conversations because you are the OG of the podcasting world. And <laughs> were it not it. for Fern Cotton, <laughs> we wouldn't, uh, you know, a vast majority of us wouldn't be having these kind of conversations. So thank you for the work that you do. And I love you, mate. Mate, oh, I love you so much. This has been so wonderful. What a, what a way to start the weekend. <laughs>